Welcome to this space within yourself. Let your breathing slow down. Let your out breath be slower than your in breath. Let your face be relaxed. Your shoulders drop. Let your arms feel open and free. Your fingers completely limp. Notice the rise and fall of your chest as you breathe. Let your breathing get even slower. Let yourself sink down out of your head. Kind of free falling out of the world of concepts, out of the world of labeling. Let your body relax. Let your abdomen be loose and fall into whatever shape works best for it when it's totally relaxed. Let your hips feel open and free. Check that your buttocks aren't clenched, your lower back no clenching, open and free. And your thighs, letting go. Your knees, your lower legs, let them feel limp. Your ankles, your feet, let your toes be limp as if your ankle joints and all the little bones in your feet are yielding and open and available. All the beautiful systems within your body that work automatically will continue to do so as we relax everything else. Slow down to a rhythm that is a rhythm from your divine essence, the pulse of creation. It can be a rhythm that comes from Mother Earth. There is a different pace, a pace that will be different to one dictated by your mind. and simply the invitation to be open to it. You're invited to be open, to listen to a slower rhythm that comes from a deeper place. It's not dictated by life, by the clock. See if you can sense, if you can feel a pace that's different to the one 
that life demands of you. Chances are it's not going to be faster. It's going to be slower. But how much slower, that's for you to decide, to discern. Is it gentle? Is it forceful? Is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it agitated? Is it calm? Try to find some way to recognize it so that the awareness of an inner rhythm can inform your mind, can have a say in how you move through life. Let's see if we can fall towards that rhythm. As if you're leaning towards it and further away from the, the personal eye. Can you trust? Can you relax enough to be able to know that, yes, I can trust what is deeper than what my mind can create? Notice if, notice if you can trust it. Notice if you do trust it. Can you fall into it? Can you dissolve? Like an ice cube melting on the sun, under the sun's rays, on warm concrete. Melting. Shifting from one state to another. And for your mind, it feels like a state. But really, it's about going back to what you know is the deeper part of you before the me, myself, I story arose. We can say to rest in that. And a little bit deeper is dissolve into it, melt into it. See if it's a resting that works for you, or is it a, a dissolving that is more open to you right now? Let go of the story of you. See if there is a sense of being free, at least for now, from the story of you. Or are you bringing it with you? Is there a knowing of that zone where there is total freedom from you? from the little you. Are you running the thought, yeah, but in 80 minutes time, I'm 
it's going to be there waiting for me again. Are you running that thought? Let's drop that thought too. Dissolve as if you'll never again re-enter your life. Can you dissolve? Can you melt? Can you let go? From any idea that life will be there for you to pick it up again. Be okay with the idea that it won't be there. Let it morph and change. If our mind sets up, yeah, this is fine, but then, you know, I'll go back to life as it was. And, you know, this might stay with me for a little bit of time. And I might listen to the recording and get another little boost. But really, my investment is keeping my life intact. I want to challenge that. Let your life go totally. It doesn't work to keep mm, to keep your life on the back burner and to drop in. It doesn't work. All of us, all of us melts into something deep inside. Melts into that which you were before, before the first concept arose. And even if it feels like it's your imagination doing this, then that's fine. I, I, I'm, I'm happy with that seed being planted. If it's more than imagination, then what you might see is that it's entirely up to you to recreate the projection of your life or not later today. It's entirely up to you. If that's what you want to pick it up where you set it down, you can do that. And so as you dissolve, melt, the invitation is to not have any connection to life at all. Not have any connection to life at all or how it was. And instead, it's useful for the mind to be curious. It's like, hmm, let's see. Let's see when I drop back into that timeline and drop back into the familiar concepts that run in my head and project out to tell me what I see and what's going on. So, you know, I'll be curious to see how that will arrange itself. Maybe it'll be completely unfamiliar. And I would like you to be comfortable with that. To have no certainty or false security in the familiarity of reconnecting to your life. Be curious. Everything might be perceived differently. And if it's perceived differently, then it is different. Or are you locked in to, I have to? Mm, are you locked into a belief of, well, things are like that and they're not going to change. Jack, you're talking bullshit because stuff needs to, like life is real. Life is out there. And it's like, mm, mm. actually life is how you project. Really, it's how you project. Your experience of it is how you project it. And so what if we left it so open 
that it might not show up at all. It's no guarantee you're going to be alive in an hour. There's none that your body is going to be alive, none at all. And is that okay? I'm looking at ways to loosen the usually unconscious compulsion to recreate the same, the same, the same. The me, myself, I, and my desires, and my likes, and my dislikes. And this stops every moment from being as fresh as it really is. Every moment is fresh. But if we keep bringing the past with us, you know, we do so because we need it to be familiar. We do so because out of habit and out of fear of not knowing how to navigate. And I'm inviting you to go into the place of deep trust, no assurances that you'll know how to navigate, no assurances of what will show up next in manifestation, wide open wide open really the place where anything can happen now some of you might have hit the zone that i'm talking to which is the field of potentiality of like where consciousness is not bound by any ideas or contracting contracting structures yet and so if you can hit that field of potentiality, there's great freedom there. As soon as you bring in, oh, I can manifest things for the little me, you've left it. You've left it. There are, are no contracting mechanisms there. It's, it's, uh, it's unlimited. The, the birthplace of manifestation. literally unlimited so to try and limit it to make something better for me it, it's kind of going back into a better me story there's no freedom from me there we're just looking for an upgrade and the invitation here is to be free of the me when you're free of the me somehow the me is very free <laughs> because that which moves through you operates in freedom but the contracted me isn't enjoying something better, another slight variation of its contracted existence. That's what we're letting go of. That's what we're letting go of. How wide does it get when you drop in? Can you taste unlimited? And just notice if you can or you can't, that's all. Don't bring a judgment there because then we're moving into the little me. Just noticing what lenses of perception are open to you right now. It's only, that, it's only your mind that shuts them out. It's the investment in the little me that stops you from dropping into the depth of, of your own being. It's choosing to orient outward instead of inward. Notice it and let's go in anyway. And however far you can access and you can know within yourself. The only comment that I'd like mind to have is, that's interesting. No judgment at all. That's important, no judgment at all. Freedom from who I think I am. And circling back into what's the rhythm, what's the pace 
of, of that zone that's not in the concept making mechanism of your mind. Can you melt there? Can you dissolve into it? Can you let it have you? Does it have permission to obliterate the projection that your mind works so hard to build and create and construct in every moment? Can you surrender all of that? So that it can disappear totally or reassemble or turn upside down. Right now, is it okay to not pick up your usual perceiving mechanisms of your personal life? Is it okay to do that? No guarantees. No future and no past unless you plug in your concept making mechanism again. We could say just now. That's not connected to the next now. And now that's not linear. Can you trust the disconnection of the timeline? Is that okay? Is it really okay to taste into the immediacy of a direct experience, however it's showing up for you right now? Is it okay when you dial into that, that there's no past? and that there's no future. Can you see that they're created by the mind, that the timeline is a conceptual structure? And to really see that, that then it's gotta be okay that your past dissolves and that your future dissolves. Doesn't work for us to leave our phenomenal life outside of the influence of pure consciousness. Like, yeah, but you can't touch my life. You, you, you can't screw up my life. I, I want to wake up, but let's, let's keep life as I know it intact. Mm. Mm. It might or it might not. You got to let it have it all. Because in holding back some part of your life, what you're doing is you're trusting the mind more than your divine essence. That's what you're doing. You're saying that version of reality, I, I, need, I need to, that's where my safety lies. That's where, really, really, sure. Hmm. Let it have all of this illusion, all of the story of you. Be free from all aspects of who you think you are. And that means the life around who you think you are. Can you access the space of where there's genuinely no attachment to your life? Genuinely. You can let it be taken. or be reorganized in a way that's not of your making. Is that okay?
and what's going on right now. Did your mind pop, pop back in without with ideas? Or is your breath infused with some Hmm. awareness really you know um, consciousness beingness divine singular that which is singular can it show up through your form and can all of you and all of your story dissolve there all of your story like to go a little bit deeper on that concept of time. You know, the dissolving of your past and your future. And I'm inviting you to really see that they're nothing more than ideas. It's all they are. Nothing more than ideas that bring some level of comfort because they have a reference point. Even if you're afraid of the future and your past was pretty crappy, there's going to be a an ease that comes from the familiarity, familiarity itself, regardless of whether it was joyous or suffering. And our system likes familiarity. That's how the mind works. It kind of wants things to be stable and doesn't matter if it's pain or pleasure. Stability is what it's looking for. The same, the same, the same is what it's looking for. So that it can navigate. So the invitation is to see, yeah, it wants the same, it wants what's reliable, it wants safety and security. And, and that's my little human mind. That's what that's doing. That machine has nothing at all to do with what I am, because it has nothing at all to do with what you are. Nothing, nothing. It's, 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 a, it's a, a virtual reality superimposed upon your divine essence. Rest in your divine essence, melt into your divine essence. And looking at time a little bit more. Do you have access to seeing that your human life is a tiny little dot, tiny little, it's so small. As, as, you, as you drop back or drop in, as you move away from your mind, whatever direction that is, and you go towards stillness, there, there is a, a lens of perception that, that expands from its contracted me, myself, I, and today, and how to manage that into, gosh, life is just a little dot, actually. My life is, remember that analogy of like, see your mind? It's like a dog barking on another planet and you're outside in the cosmos. Those scales are very use, useful for pulling back from the personal, from the concept making mechanism that does me, myself, I. And while I'm directing you or inviting you to go to zones that fundamentally are, you know, the pointers are concepts. These are concepts that are created by pure consciousness. It's before the me contracted individual separate lens of perception is activated. So there's two sets of lenses, no? There's ones that are particular to your human brain, which does separation and labeling. And then consciousness is the one that does pure beauty, pure love, existence, time, space. And time is the interesting one 
because time is where where mm, it's this you know way back and way forward but the only way to contract into it is with a me story that's what gives it mm, um, a point in which to show up as today it has to be with a me story Those of you who have access to other dimensions or who are able to communicate with those who've passed away or can can jump into past lives, you'll know that the timeline is a little bit skewed up. People who've passed away don't realize how long it is, how long ago it is. Um, or maybe you can zip out and go along the timeline and drop into the past and drop into the future. And we can even do this when we're healing our past. It's like, God, it was, or, or we smell something that we didn't smell for so many years. It's like, whoa, just for a moment, you were back there. So there, there is a kind of a flexibility that's more than memory. There's a flexibility to jump along the timeline. However, the, the thing that stabilizes it is my body is in this timeline. My life is in this timeline. And so the individual makes today show up as today, your body. And the invitation is, as we step back, as we move away into the depth of everything, nothing, purity, consciousness, awareness, stillness, prior to the story of me, as we move towards that, our human life is this little teeny tiny dot because our mm, addiction, I was going to say, our attraction to today being whatever it is, the 3rd of January, 2021, the contraction to that is dependent on our physical life plugging into the context of time. Outside of that, you get to see that jeepers, my human life is a frigging flicker. It's just a flicker. And so can you, can you taste where you know, don't go for a concept, don't go for a concept. Can you taste where you know, where you can maybe see, where you can sense that my physical life really is nothing. It's nothing, it's a flicker. It's a tiny, tiny little breaking wave on top of a huge ocean. That's really, that's really my life. So the invitation is to pull away from the, 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 the stickiness of the timeline. If you've got a sense of, yeah, my life is a little drop in the ocean, it's, it's really short. And you can sense, wow, you know, I'd have to think about 2017. That was a whole year, but what really happened? And unless something significant happened, it's kind of going to be a blur with the year before or the year after, unless something specifically marked it. But that's a whole year. So time is a quirky thing, huh? And how we think about time is a quirky thing. And I'm inviting you to see, to see time, the timeline, and that a human life is a speck, a speck. When somebody sees this, if there is a eureka around your mortality, if there's total acceptance of your mortality, it tends to loosen up our addiction to time. If your brain somewhere has a belief that you're immortal, that actually my life is just going to go on and on, it tends to be a real grasping of our mind to the timeline and past and future, it tends to be a, 
a hidden place of where we're attached to the body. It's a little sneaky one. We think, we unconsciously think we're immortal because we never really looked at it. One way to look at it is in the wider view, if you know that you're, you're a little blip in the timeline, a tiny, tiny, tiny little grain of sand in this whew, big desert of grains of sand, and there's your little life. Only you divinity, only you as pure consciousness can recognize that. I want you to recognize that. In the recognition of it, if you can anchor that into your belly, then your own mortality becomes normal. This translates into being not attached to my life. If there is a knowing that, yes, this body will die, this body really will die. If there's a knowing that it's a tiny, insignificant grain of sand in the Sahara, of sand. That understanding how the, how the, I suppose how, how, how an abiding awakening shows up is the knowing that the amount of heartbeats that this physical heart will take, it's, it's kind of already got its number up. And in the knowing that every breath, every moment is an exquisite gift, exquisite. When you view it from your divine center, from the stillness within, then how you approach your life will change completely. It necessitates the acceptance of your mortality. It necessitates your awareness of time being a concept that only contracts when I believe I am who I think I am. There's loads of layers to that teaching. And so wherever made sense for you, fine. Re-listen to this piece when you get the audio. Re-listen to it and see if you can take the next step and the next step and the next step. That would be a good idea. Where are you around the connection between my mortality connects with addiction to the timeline that will influence my future and my past and how I, how I deal with those concepts in my head. It will make me miss the freshness and fullness of every moment because I'm looking at causes and consequences and I don't like and I want. We're, we're trying to look, we're completely in the timeline, completely in the timeline. And one beautiful thing to recognize the freshness of every moment. It's like, this is, this is all that's showing up. This is all that's showing up right now. I have to go into my head to look at the past and the future. And in this moment, I can do something. I can still wash this mug after the TSC. I can still wash this mug. In that moment, I'll be washing the mug, not because I don't like a, a mug sitting on the table that's half full of tea. It's more about an availability to be pure, pure, no, um, singularly available to the present moment if your attention is, is on the present moment in the soft, gentle way, recognizing that I have to go into my head for the past, I have to go into my the head for my future, you will still participate in a way that influences your future and your past, but you don't have to think about it. The past and the future are other stories that are there and that are blessed, totally blessed when all of your attention is in dealing with this moment, responding to this moment. 
And that's how it looks. That's how it kind of acts out. When, when you have several of these points, you're melting into the divine. There's a recognition that the timeline is completely a concept and that to focus in on the, the, the today that's in the timeline requires a conceptual shift. It's totally possible abiding awakened state has the viewpoint that the, the timeline is a construct. The freshness of this moment is, is where I, I am connecting. I, I am, I'm showing up. Something is showing up. So, something is working through this form in this, this moment. There has to be a knowing of the mortality of your body in order for that to stick in order for that to become the new normal. The mortality of your body, if it's denied, and if somewhere you kind of believe you'll live forever, check, because it'll be in your unconscious, most likely in your unconscious. I think, I, I, yeah, I probably think I'm going to live forever. Maybe this is your last day. Now, if that feels, actually that's genuinely okay, not because I want out, it's not about wanting out or wanting more. That's not it either. That's fulfilling a desire. Genuinely, if this is your last day, if this is your last day, can you say, bring it on, this is my last day? Not an avoidance and not out of desire. And so that technique is, is to Let's see how comfortable you are around accepting your mortality. And if there's an acceptance of your mortality, there isn't such an attachment to your future, to your past. Something is available to be present. Something more can show up and doesn't get um, diluted, diverted by how the mind wants to control and make things better for me. Do you know you're mortal? And another useful tool for dealing with your mortality is, you know, have you made a, a will? Have you, where's all that at? And if you haven't done it, why not? Just why not? It's just another way to, to, to see if there's something hidden there. just going to refer to um, a chat box comment there. Um, it, it's also, mm, also it's been done already. So why try to control it? I just want to make sure that, that there's no bypassing there. Because if a spiritual concept is used to influence your mind, it doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't work. It's about unraveling what, what made your mind believe something other than truth. It, it won't hold to say, well, it's already in, in the can, as I often say. It's already in the can. It's already done. So why control it? It's like mm, those two sentences don't, don't connect up with me. If there is a seeing that it's already in the can, then it's already in the can. But it's, it's, it's not going to be useful for that to kind of educate your mind to how it really works. 
It's about your mind dissolving. Why does it want to control? Why does it want to control? And then that makes sense. It's like there is a knowing that this has already happened. And as a result of that recognition, I could see that my need to control came from a fear of death, uh, abandonment issues from early on, some trauma that, that, that was unresolved, uh, uh, the, the, the feeling that I had no control for, from, you know, in my workplace or in, my, in a relationship, or, and I'm constantly trying to compensate for that because I don't want to be in that situation again. It's through unraveling the causes of the patterns where the truth of it's already in the can, can penetrate. You see, we can't go to the place of where we know the truth and then make the phenomenal life better without, without seeing through what's going on in the phenomenal life. We've got to do that piece of digging it out by the root. We die in each moment. The joke is that we think we are the energy that comes through these bodies. Well, we think we're lots of things, don't we? <laughs> and we are everything at, at a particular lens of perception. I'm Jack and I'm a human woman at one's lens of perception and another lens of perception. I'm absolutely not Jack at all. And that's a more authentic one. That's a wider one, a deeper one. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's more authentic. It's not the virtual reality lens. And so, so I suppose let's, let's be okay with I am and I'm not. Having, letting there be space for, there's, there's places where it's appropriate that I am Jack the woman and I'm functioning as a wife or a friend or, and, and, and yet there's something inside knowing that that's a role being played. That's a role being played. So it's about never sucking right into it, into the total belief, as Brandy's saying, the total belief that you are one thing. Move it from, I believe I am ABCD to that, that role of ABCD, they can be played and I'm standing someplace much deeper. I'm tasting, I'm having the direct experience of something much deeper. There is no I in that zone. There is no personal in that zone. You can say I'm all of it or I'm none of it. And then there's deeper than that, but let's get this one really solid. Patrick, does mortality include the end of all subtle bodies and consciousness, individual or otherwise? Uh -huh. Good question, Patrick. Okay, if, if you have access to subtle bodies, um, uh, th those various planes, then there's two layers. There's, there's a, the mortality of the body and then there's the mortality of consciousness, which is disembodied, which, which operates at other levels of, um, um, I suppose we could say energetic or frequency or vibration or fragments of light, really. Um, so there's two layers. Because some people are like, you know, I'm totally fine with, my, with, with, with mortality, with my body dying. I'm going to go to the angelic realm and I'll be able to help my family from there. And I'm going, oh, shoot. We just swapped out one for another. All right, so, so being an angel is better than my life right now. So that ain't gonna work. They all get taken, they all get taken. So, so if Patrick, you have, you have access to these subtle layers, if, if you know that you as consciousness are a multidimensional, you know, you have ability to go to these other planes. Yeah, even that's gonna shut down, even that. Even that shuts down to hand it all back. You know, hand it all back, all of it. So, so for somebody like that, who, who has access to jumping in and out of other, other um, 
not even jumping, I suppose. I'm more of a jumper. Um, uh, f floating, drifting in and out of these other layers of consciousness. If you are somebody like that, then nothing. I mean, nothing and take the concept of nothing away. Nothing. Hang there. Hang there. Because before you hang there, there'll be a problem with what you lose. I needed to be an authentic hanging out there, an authentic recognition of there's nothing. There isn't even the concept of nothing. There really is nothing. When that's authentically seen, then you'll have gone through the grief of your physical mortality and the grief of not being able to play in and out of every dimension. You know, the letting go of it. Because when we, when we, if, if there is any trace of avoidance of like, yeah, I can let go of all of that. It's like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure you can let it go? Because in theory, sure, I can let my life stop right now. Is that like, really? That means what about your children? What about, what, what are you attached to? Where, where are the attachments? And so when we grab onto the concept, we're not we're not exposing ourselves to where the attachments can be. And if those attachments aren't seen through and dissolved, they're going to rise up again. They're going to rise up again. And, and then you'll have this like half arsed awakening, which is kind of like, oh yeah, I can remind myself to go in here. And then I forget. And then I remind myself and then I forget. And I'm, oh man, Whew. that's exhausting. And kind of inauthentic, you know, that in and out thing. question, shouldn't we become detached from the false ideal of self-improvement? Uh, self-improvement. All right. So self-improvement phenomenally, if that's in the present moment, why not? I'm studying something actually that's, that's going to be certified an online course. I haven't studied something since I did my US driving license. And before that, I'd say I was in my twenties. Yep. Since I did any kind of academic qualification based course. I'm like, wow, I'm learning something again. I'm learning something phenomenally. So learning something phenomenally, sure, it, it, sure. I, I know I'll be, I'll be better wired to serve. I, I, I know I will. I know that's what's going on here. Do I want to, I need to upskill in order to serve better? No, didn't come from that at all. Comes from being available in the present and this is what's happening now. And there's a pull towards this. And so self-improvement for your personality, that's part of your humanness. And so you're right, Julie, like the false ideal of self-improvement, the ideal of it would be a problem. The ideal of it is false. The humanness, when it's allowed to be fully human and fully divine, there is an evolution of of improvement that goes on without any attachment to anything without any personal motivation at all it, it, it's just like nature moves towards birth death birth death refinement evolution of the species it's that rhythm we get out of the way enough so that the human evolution is allowed to have its own rhythm and it will want to do better but for no other reason except it's the natural rhythm of of, of our humanness so you're right in saying the ideal of self-improvement is false however let there be space for your humanness to flow as it wants to because the divine is expressing as a human and the human evolution is implicit in your humanness. So it means kind of freeing yourself up, being so available that, hey, whatever it's going to do, it's going to be honored. I think 
I kind of think a lot about any moment being the last one, which allows me to have that wide perspective every day. But somehow, I think those thoughts are coming from fear. Some people say they never think about death, and I can't comprehend that. I guess I'm asking how to differentiate between being in fear and being in faith. That's kind of a beautiful question, isn't it? I'm delighted that you that 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 you are recognizing your mortality. And I'm super delighted that you're feeling there's an essence of fear in there. There's a grasping, there's an essence of fear. So your mortality is there. Can you feel an expansion? Let's go with the felt sense because, because I mm, because here to swap out one concept for another is not going to work. Your mind is going to be dodging. And sometimes if we go for this, um, an energetic shift, the, the, we can kind of uh, bypass the mind a little bit. So, so go to the feeling of fear of death. You think about death every day, but there's a little edge of fear in it. These are my words, but I think you're saying somehow I think those thoughts are coming from fear. All right. So they are, because you'd know it if there was no fear there. You'd know it. So if there's a suspicion, there's fear there. So well done on that. So here's a thought right in this moment about I'm going to die. This, this is all going to shut down soon. I, death can come in any moment. All right. Run that thought again without any fear, without any contraction, with a yes, that is how this plays. With a total expansion, because death will, or, or, mm, the fear of death will bring in a contraction and it'll be a little me who's afraid of death. And you could be a little me afraid of poverty and a little me afraid of uh, the climate won't be here or the planet won't be here because of climate change in 10 years time. I mean, we can run any fear, any story will do. So let's move into the expansion of like, yes, death will come. Is there a, a smile on my face as death comes? So that you're changing your physiological response to the concept. We're not changing the concept. We're, we're changing how it registers in your body. Because what the concept of this might be my last moment is doing right now is it's going to your emotional center and it's cranking up a little bit of fear. And now we've got a contraction and we're believing the thought and the thought is somehow a bit of a threat. And so let the thought be there without it going to your emotional center. Because the thought is is true. It might be your last moment and some moment will be your last moment and we probably won't know it. We probably won't know it. We'll just stop. We might know it half an hour beforehand. Oh my God, I'm approaching death, but I don't get any, I've never seen any evidence that we actually are that aware. We're in the process of dying. You know, we're in the process of leaving. And so we actually don't know when the last moment is. You know, the people who might be around us as we pass, if we're with somebody, if we, if our destiny shows up that that's how we pass, they might have a way of saying, yep, he's gone, she's gone, they're gone. Maybe so, maybe so. But you won't know, you won't know. As good as it's gonna get is like, I think I'm, I think I'm dying. I think I'm passing away. And so when that idea comes, if you're somebody who, who has an idea, um, who has a thought about this could be my last day, but it brings a contraction, it brings fear. It's like, all right, can I let that thought be there? Because it's true. Yeah, th there is going to be a last moment and this actually might be it. It's very valid. Let it be here without it going to my emotional center. Can that concept be here without, without it linking up with fear? No emotion at all. Second step, bring in the emotion of yes, wide open. So be it. So be it. If this is the last moment, so be it. So that you're dissolving into it, melting into it. It's that... total acceptance of what is so that the, the the thought of this could be my last moment total acceptance of that thought too play with that 
and let's see if it stays there or if it dissolves. And why I'm saying, let's see if it stays there or dissolves is that what might happen is that the fear attaches to something else because your body might be familiar with cranking up a little bit of fear, a little bit of subtle fear every day to keep you contracted into believing you are who you think you are. And so let's watch. As you do that practice, I'm wondering if fear will grab to another story instead of the death story. And if it does, then it's like, all right, that has nothing to do with death, actually. That has to do with, with my body running fear, and any story will do. So, so there's a few layers to that one. Wendy, at the moment, I am experiencing a lot of anger. It has been triggered by redundancies at my workplace. Your reminder about mind seeking stability and familiarity is helpful. However, it feels like there is a band of anger that is keeping me tied to the timeline. It feels like there is something stuck there. I'm seeing it and welcoming it, but it feels like something else that is going on that I can't see. Your teaching today is bringing the question about, is it just a habit of familiarity? Can you help? Yeah. Wendy, um, I, 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 I heard an interview with um, uh, Jill Bolt Taylor um last night actually i often listen to podcasts in the middle of the night if i can't sleep or something say, okay let's see what's going on there let's see what's going on there and i heard an interview and i would remember that jack it's going to come up in the tsc it's interesting you know and it's like here it is <laughs> anyway that's a little jack story um jill bolt taylor you know wrote that book years ago because she she had a, a stroke um uh she had a stroke and, and, and an awakening process, but of course she wasn't there at all. So she had to rebuild the ego and learn how to, how to function again. So she got a great glimpse through, through her one side of her brain, you know, her default mode network was, was just flooded with blood. So, so, um, you know, so she woke up while she was in hospital. So a good glimpse, but it couldn't last because she hadn't pulled things out by the roots. So now it's like years later, I don't know, is it like 15 years later or something? Years later. And she spoke in this, um, in this podcast and she said, as she's unraveling her own journey, she said, the energy of anger, specifically anger she spoke about, lasts 90 seconds each time you touch the thought. It's 90 seconds. She said, if you don't believe me, time it. It lasts 90 seconds. What happens then is before the 90 seconds is out, you've gone back and you've reignited, put your attention on that thought again. And the, it looks like the anger is continuous because our attention is on, repeatedly on the thought. And she's right. It's about the thought that's creating the anger. Releasing the anger, and I bet you've tried that, Wendy, like releasing the anger, mm, if it's, if it's on a loop and it's like continuous, yeah, we're stuck because the original thought is the problem. We're going to the original thought. Now, if you've processed the original thought and done that work around, yeah, I can actually accept that people are laid off from work. I can accept that, you know, that this is what had to happen. The root cause underneath the current story, the root cause of anger is always a desire that's not met from some other time. When we're done with, okay, it's 90 seconds and, and I'm not going to go near the thought. I'm not going to get near the thought. Do that layer. Okay, there's the thought. Okay, I can work on the thought. I can see what the thought is. I have to accept that this is what the universe is showing up. Can I find that place? Uh -uh, the anger is still going on. I can process all that and the anger is still there. Root cause of anger is always a desire in your history that wasn't met. That's where to go if you've done the other layers. And that root cause of desire is showing up. And some part of your unconscious is tapping into it within the 90 second bandwidth length of time. The 90 second length of time is all that one thought will shoot chemicals of anger for 90 seconds. A minute and a half, that's it. 
So if it feels continuous anger or does it feel like recurring anger, that's the first thing. So then we know, okay, how often are you going to the thought? All right, so what thought? We think it's about what's happening at work at the moment. Let's, let's dial down. Okay, process those thoughts. I want you to find the unresolved desire from someplace way back that is bleeding its way to your conscious mind through what's happening at work at the moment and feeding into this band of anger. So that's where the stuckness is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to read Brandy's comments here, comment here because it, it, it correlates with, with Patrick, with the, the um, Patrick's question from a few minutes ago. What Patrick is talking about was the hardest part for me. I had so much fear and was just shocked. I couldn't even talk and it took years to assimilate. Almost created such a shock like it was PTSD, knowing that I am truly a dream and nothing really exists. Darkness and nothingness. Darkness? Hmm. Darkness exists? Hmm. I wonder. Darkness? I'm putting a question mark behind beside that one. Because not even darkness exists. I can see you clapping, Brandy. <laughs> okay. Question from uh, Jaipriya. Is there a way to help the body open to this nothing? or death place. For a long time now, every time I drop into that place or even start to, my abdomen contracts. Tears come. My head, neck feels like they're going to explode. This makes it nearly impossible to hang out there. No matter what I try, I can't seem to shift this. I haven't had more than very temporary success. Not sure how to help the body with this. Or if this is just desires or emotions showing up in the body as contraction, etc. Yeah, let's see what the contraction is, what the contraction is about, because your body, your body, um, your, your body is, is responding to a different set of beliefs. What's your body saying? Your, your body is screaming at you and, and, and you know you can't, you can't handle it for long. If you drop into that place, Oh, drop in there. You, the first one you said is my abdomen contracts, tears come, my head, my, my neck feels like it's going to explode. Go into where your abdomen contracts. And it's like, okay, I'm the container for this. What I am is the container for this physiological contraction. And sit with that. Do that um, trauma healing exercise that we've dipped into a lot during this Truth Serum Cafe, during other Truth Serum Cafes. My divinity, you know, if you drop in and you have a meditation or even just after a meditation and you're in that zone of being able to access peace, if you can't do it on your own, find a guided meditation to bring you in. You will eventually be able to do it on your own for sure. And so in that peace zone, it's like, all right, now I'm wel welcoming in my stomach contraction. I'm welcoming it in. And so what you're doing is like, okay, my mind, I'm staying in my divine essence. I'm staying in this wider view and my mind can go to mortality and let the stomach contraction show up. Let it be here. Let it be here. If you give it space, the contraction begins to move. It begins to move because it's contained within something, not a muscular clench, but it's contained within something that's safer, that has more wisdom. You see? And so you could say, okay, stomach contraction, what's going on? Even like, what color are you? What shape are you? What do you need right now? And let love come into it. Let peace come into it. Hold it. Be aware of it. Don't let it hide. Don't let it shrink. Because contraction is about shrinking for safety. It's like, let the response to danger be present. Let the response to danger be present. Because your mind is, is, is computing death with danger. So that was learned somewhere. That's an imprint from somewhere, from something. And so 
open it up. It's like, yeah, okay, let's be open. Death can come at any time. Death can come at any time. Can we say yes to that? What's so awful about that? And see what your stomach says. And so from the abdomen, I think you'll get some insight from the abdomen. I think that'll start to unravel the, 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 the tears and your neck and your head tightness. I think it will. So abdomen contraction is where you go. Regarding mortality, there seems to be a continuity of energy, like a law of nature. Regarding mortality, there's a continuity of energy, like a law of nature. Okay. Okay. Yes, there's a continuity of energy. However, be sure you're not using that as, um, as, as, as a way to be immortal. There needs to be a complete letting go of even the continuity of energy, even that continuity. That's similar to the Patrick Brandy um, uh, discussion around other dimensions, interdimensionality. All of that shuts off too at some point when there's a total abiding in pure consciousness and nothing else. I mean, going to nothing, 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 really, really being out of, uh, out of this virtual reality being completely free of it and allowing it to play as, as the divine plays, then, then the, the, the continuity of energy is part of the illusion, is part of the virtual reality. And so separate from that too, in the way Patrick and Brandy were speaking about. If there has been insights and knowing in parts, but still some fear right at the precipice of total surrender, any suggestions of how to lovingly be with this so that the dissolving can happen? My heart races and beats a little harder even asking this. Oh, it's, it's beautiful, Crystal. It's beautiful because, because you know what to do. Any suggestions of how to be, of how to lovingly be with this so that the dissolving can happen. That's how, that's how. So, so we, know, we know the how in terms of what the brain does, what, what your mind does. The mind loves how. The doing it, though, when it comes to your heart, the instructions are, are concepts. And then it's a, it's, a, it's a felt sense part. It's direct experience. It's, 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 it's something that only happens now in being totally present with that fear. So, so the how is like, okay, I've got to be lovingly with it and, and allow it to dissolve. And I'm so lovingly with it that if it dissolves or doesn't dissolve, I don't mind. The love has to be that authentic, that compassionate, that allowing, no judgment, no expectation. Unconditional love is what that is, unconditional love. And so in drop in to your divine essence, shift your perspective so that your the beingness, that purity, that simple one, you know, that where there's only one. And invite in. Invite in that fear. The fear of surrender. Invite it in. It might be fear. It really might be sur about surrender. It might be fear that will attach to another story. Let's leave space for both. So it's a doing. It's a doing. The how is the instructions and you already have the how. You already have the how. Be really present to it. So it means kind of setting yourself up, leaving your mind and dropping into your heart and opening your heart. And it might be, nah, I'm, my mind is still there. I can't do it today. It's like, all right, try again in a half an hour. Do something super relaxing. Have a bath or slow down or do, you know, five or six slow out breaths or breathe in for seven, breathe out for seven, you know, you, different yogic breathing. Do things to like really dial down so that you're completely out of your fight or flight because that's the thing about the loving container. That's the, that's the key to, to, um, to healing your own survival mechanisms that keep the little eye attached is to, to be able to access presence 
in this moment that is not activating your fight or flight because we're inviting in your fight fight or flight without identification with it you see so to be in that place of unconditional love there ain't no access to your fight or flight survival mechanism that part of your nervous system can't be active it just can't be active otherwise you, 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 your mind is coming with you the influence of some other chemicals is coming with you so if you're going to be the container the loving container for a story that's registered in your fight or flight mechanism mm, mm, there's got to be a serious difference between the two so you've got to be standing in the zone of where the fight or flight it's like whoa i can see my physiology that's what that does and i'm so not that right now i i see my body and i see what it does and i've total compassion for it all right now i can bring that one in do you see so it's um i don't know it's 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 um it works <laughs> it works I think about death fairly often, and I tend to think that I'm not afraid of it. More and more, I tend not to feel like I am fully here anyway. But there is a fear of possible pain or disability that might precede physical death. I wonder if I'm kidding myself in thinking I'm not afraid of death, and if it's masquerading as fear of pain. Ha, ah, good question, Catherine. I've seen that question come up quite a bit in, um, in private sessions with people that it's before I die. I'm not afraid of death, it's before I, but like, you know, if you break a leg or you break a hip or something, like what? you can run a story of being fearful of any physical pain, but why would you run that story? Because when you're in physical pain, of course you'll manage it. Of course you'll manage it. Like, is the pain will kill you? No, the pain won't kill you. But what difference does it make if you're in physical pain? Like if you're in physical pain right now, you stub your toe when you're walking into the kitchen later today. Like, do you want to run a, a fear about that now? Because that's what you're doing. You're running a fear about something that you have no guarantee is going to happen. So what's happening is that fear has attached to that story. So I'm interested in the fear of physical pain. Why do you think you can't manage that? And it's attached itself to this unknown, this other uncontrollable thing like physical death. So it's got bells and whistles, but I think it's more about the fear of physical pain. I think it is of not being able to control pain, that pain will be so much off the Richter scale. But sure, but, but you, the pain won't kill you. Pain won't kill you. It's not that potent. For me, I don't mind physical pain at all because my body is in pain and I'm fine. My body's in pain and I'm fine. And as a result, I have a high threshold for pain. So they say. But at the same time, because I'm very sensitive to energies, I feel things very quickly. I, you know, every allopathic doctor would say, God, you're so sensitive to stuff. I'm like, yep. So both exist, you know, I have a high threshold for pain and I can pick up some nuanced thing going on in my body that, that really shouldn't, you know, doesn't show that it's elevated, but I know it's elevated and like, okay, let's wait for six months and then you'll see it on my bloods or something that it's elevated, but I can tell you right now it's elevated. That happens all the time. So, so you, you can be highly sensitized to pain and have a very high threshold. The, it's, it's about being open. It's about being available for all of it, not hiding from anything, being aware in the present moment, moment for what shows up. Why and how could anything show up in the present moment that you can't deal with? Like, how would that even be possible? That you as the divine being that you are would create an experience that it itself can't tolerate. Isn't that a bit wacky? Can, can you see where that doesn't make sense? That I've created something and I won't be able to endure it. That's an I thought. That's an I thought. Your divine essence creates all of it. And 
the little grain of sand that is the Catherine story and physical pain that the Catherine story imagines that it won't be able to tolerate. Can you see the disproportion? And, and physical death is about letting go of that, pulling away from the physical body, pulling away from it. Physical pain, sure, sure. That, that, if that right now has, has cranks up attachment to your body, then it makes sense that you would run that story with death. It would make sense because then it would be, I won't be able to experience death and you might be running that story. Um, I'm not sure if you are or not, but I know there's other people who have that fear and they run this story too, that I won't be able to, I'll die roaring, basically, I'll die roaring, that I won't be able to experience the, the transition of death. How are you going to experience it is already kind of written. That's in your destiny. You'll experience it how you're going to experience it and it will be exquisite. You came in successfully, even if it was traumatic, and you leave successfully, even if that's traumatic. It's all fine. It's rolling out as it must, as it must. And so how are you around physical pain in your body? Can we change your relationship with your body now when it's in pain? Can you view physical pain from a different place without avoiding, without dissociating? Is there a knowing, yep, yeah, my body is really screaming right now and are you fine or are you suffering is all of you suffering that's a very good test so even if you're like you know you get a paper cut from picking up an envelope it's like all right there's physical pain am i totally fine and is there physical pain exercise that muscle so that the lens of perception um doesn't my body is in pain, therefore my lenses of perception are all in the me, myself, I. Practice when there's any physical pain at all. Go for a long hike so that, so that you've got muscles, muscle pain tomorrow. Like, test it out and say, is there pain in my body and am I okay? So that, so that you're able to register, your nervous system can register physical pain and you know you're okay. I would put that into practice. I would put that into practice, develop that neural pathway so that physical pain can happen. And it's not all me, myself, I that's activated in that moment. That's where to go. Because then, however, the body is going to die, if it's in serious pain, well, kind of so what? My body is in pain. My body might shut down because of this pain. Well, it won't shut down because of the pain. It'll be shut down because of the, sim the pain is the symptom of, of what might what might be causing your death, you know? So it's, you're not gonna die from pain. So we can step back from pain and allow the body to feel what it needs to feel. And the only reason that it's feeling pain is because it's urging you to heal something or to rest or to bring your attention to something. That's, that's what the pain is there for. So it's a beautiful thing to be in physical pain is a beautiful self-healing, self-protective mechanism. But our brain interprets it as another kind of protection, protection of the me, myself, I. That's not what's going on. It's not what's going on. Let the body do its thing. You're not your body. Okay. Just, I know we're at the time. Just one last question. Does this 90 second principle hold true for emotions other than anger? Yeah, that um, neuro, neuro, I don't know what her profession is. She's a neuro, neuroscientist, neuroscientist. Um, uh, she says, yes. She says, yes, it does. It's, it's uh, the chemical of any emotion from one thought will last 90 seconds. Any chemical will last. So even sadness, even grief, it's like you're touching, you're touching the thought again. To have a continu continuous, you're touching the thought again. You're touch and sometimes we need to do that, to like let it run, like with grief or something. It's like, let it have you because it'll whew, come in waves and it'll be gone again. And maybe there's 15 thoughts in a wave of grief Maybe there's 15 thoughts of loss and letting go and memory and fine, and it'll go, you know? But, but stuff during the day where, where it does our head in, you know, where we're running emotion, running a repetitive thought, start noticing, saying, wow, I'm thinking that again, I'm thinking that again. Time it if you want to, time it and say, okay, so the, uh, 
the the feeling here is like abandonment okay how long is this one here's the feeling watch it watch it don't go back to the thought it will be gone in 90 seconds I'll have a look at the questions next year and do my best next week and do my best next year and do my best to um to respond to them then bless you all and 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 may you remember who you truly are in every moment catch it on river <laughs>